Uh, years ago, I was uh, chronically late to work every single day. I would call uh, my supervisor as I was coming through the gate at 645, and I would say, I'm here. I'm almost at the gate. I'm, I'm, I'm on base. I'm on base. And that wasn't necessarily good enough. Sometimes it was. But one time, I called them and said, um, I was on 564, stuck in traffic. There were five carriers in port at that time, which meant that you sometimes get to work, uh, I don't know, eventually. Like, it just doesn't happen. And so, uh, I'd have to leave at like 445 in the morning to get there uh, just by 645. Just a rough time. And so... um, uh, and so I called him and said, I'm, I'm, I'm right there. He said, good, I'll wait for you. And I was still on 564. I still had probably 30 minutes before I was going to actually be in my office. And um, I walked in, and his name was Jack. And Jack said, uh, Whitney, because that's my last name. He said, Whitney, man, like, what, what is the deal? You've been late, like, every day for the last two weeks. We don't ask much of you, but just to be here on time, man, what's the deal? And I, you know, gave the slew of excuses we all give that are somewhat true. Well, you know, the the traffic and, uh, man, I realized I was out of gas, so I had to stop for gas and I didn't plan for that. And, uh, you know, and then the traffic and everyone's trying to go to the same spot, you know, hundreds of thousands of people or whatever and all using the same road. And it's a beautiful system that's been created where you can only go through three entries and they just, you know, so it's not my fault. It's, 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 well, he said, so the traffic. I said, yeah, it's the traffic. It's the traffic. He said, well, here's the thing. Um, The traffic is there every day. So you're going to have to figure out how to navigate the traffic to be here on time. And tomorrow, if you're late, when you come, plan on staying. So you can bet the next day I figured out how to navigate the traffic so that I was there on time. And I remember thinking, man, when I get in charge, you know, I'll never do that. And you know what I did to the guys that were late? I would sit them down and say, tell me why you're late. Oh, the traffic. Well, you know what? The traffic is there every single day with my cup of coffee. You know, as they went, <laughs> that's what happens. I, 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 I tell you that because um, what we're going to look at today is... What Proverbs tells us about glorifying God through our our work. And what I found out in my life, and I haven't always been a pastor, but even still now as a pastor, that there is a way that you can work that honors and glorifies God greatly. Some of you have a job that is seen by others, that they know if you don't show up or if you don't do your job or if you work hard or if you slack. And some of you have a job that no one would know what you did because you uh, have a job that you work by yourself or you don't have regular hours or whatever. And in both of those things, there is a way that that you can work to glorify God or, well, work for something else. And likewise, there's a way that you can work in those situations that when others see you and then know you are a Christian, you can glorify God and make the name of Jesus look really good, or you can make the name of Jesus look really, really bad. And as we give all sorts of excuses as to why we can't perform our job at to the level that we are being paid to, whether we agree or not that the pay is sufficient, as we are giving those excuses, we oftentimes make Jesus look dumb because the lost guy around us can figure out how to navigate the traffic. Now, you know this, right? You know this. You know that a beautiful way to validate your, uh, what it means to walk with Jesus, to represent Jesus to those around you, a great way is doing well at your job. And a great way to make Jesus look dumb or whatever you are and whatever you stand for look dumb is to be bad and terrible at your job. 
Now, I had one guy uh, that was also a believer that, that worked for me, and he was having a hard time, and he came in and said, like, hey, Tim, I mean, like, I just, I feel like I'm being persecuted because my team doesn't like me, and they're, uh, they always leave me out, and I get mixed, I get sent out, or don't get to go, or, like, I just feel like they're always making fun of me, and that kind of a thing, and so I just feel like it's persecution. Can you pray for me? And I, I looked back at him and said, bro, it has nothing to do with being a Christian. You're late all the time. You aren't, you're dink, you're, di- you're, you're uh, a delayed qualification on your, on your quals. You complain a lot and you don't do your job well. Like, that's not persecution. That's just called consequences, right? You're not doing your job. Therefore, you're not getting good evals. So the solution for you is I'm going to pray that God would help you do your job. You see, there's a beautiful thing that happens when there's a believer who loves Jesus and is faithful at doing his job, especially if you are in a culture where trying to get away with as much as possible, do as little as possible for, uh, with as little oversight as possible and no motivation forward, if that's what everything is going on around you, man, it doesn't take much to show up on time looking okay with uh, with the qualification and knowledge that you need to perform your job well. It doesn't take much to stand out. I told them, if you just show up on time, ready to do the job with your qualifications, you're like 95% of the way there, right? The other 5% is simply not doing dumb things to make Jesus look dumb. Now, that's, that is in that culture what it looked like. There was a way where we were to glorify God in our work, and there was a way, and an easy way, and the way that most people took to make Jesus look dumb because you and your action make Jesus look just like everybody else. In fact, today what we're going to see is that uh, a really, really cool title for this uh, sermon that I worked really, really hard on. Actually, I couldn't figure out what else to call it, so I called it this, How to Glorify God and Kick Satan's Butt at Work. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth. You have enough faults, failures, and weaknesses of your own that you will at times make Jesus look dumb. And in the process of sanctification, getting more and more, growing more and more like Jesus, you will learn and grow how to navigate the journey of work as a Christian with what you are doing. But there is a very real enemy that would love to defame the name of Christ in your life by allowing you to serve or allowing you to believe or allowing you, tempting you to cut corners, knowing that when you cut a corner, others looking at you who bear the name of Christ are seeing someone who represents Christ. And in their mind, we've all done this before. We make Jesus look stupid. You see, we, we, we work for all sorts of reasons. Uh, sometimes I talk with people who are dissatisfied with their job. And by the way, this isn't about job satisfaction, but who are dissatisfied with their job and they're dissatisfied because, and they describe it as like, well, I don't know, it's, it's, I don't feel fulfilled, like it's just paying the bills. And you say like, that's a big deal, right? We, we work to pay bills. What happens if you don't pay bills? Life gets terrible, right? Like we work because we earn based on working, at least most of the time with few exceptions. That's the principle. A good worker is worthy of his wages. We work to pay bills and earn money. We work to accomplish things. Like, nothing gets done by itself. Someone somewhere has to do something. If you ever get involved in church work, you know that Every single light that's turned on and bulletin in a seat and a song that's prepared and volumes up and down and making sure it's too hot or too cold or on that note, we're in a season where it's going to be, we're not going to get it right. All right. It's just the weather's going to change overnight. It's going to be too cold and then it's going to change again. It's going to be too hot. It doesn't matter what we set it at. So like, I hear you share it with me. 
but just know like, mm, the sweat for Jesus today or whatever, right? Just, right? Just, just know that, okay? So anyways, like all of that stuff has to happen. At your work, just think about what you do. Every piece of paper that you use got ordered by somebody and every pen that you use and every email that you sent is on a server that somebody maintained and in a building that someone built or whatever. Like we work to, to accomplish things. Now, you might not get seen with your accomplishment. Your accomplishment might have been including the straw in the uh, bag of the fast food place that you work at or whatever. Maybe it's not highly revered, but you are, you're accomplishing something or it's something big that everyone sees or whatever that's, you know, Instagram worthy or Facebook worthy. Like, like we, but you are, you're working to accomplish something. You, you also work because like that's just what people do. Listen, there's not a culture anywhere that values, rather that has as one of its values, not value as in finds worth, but values as in this is what we culturally push to strive for, people who simply do not work. Around the world, hard work is a high value. We work because that's what people do. You are designed to do something. But you're designed to do something isn't just because you're human. You're designed to do something because as a human, you were made in the image of God and the image of, of the God who does indeed work. Now, God has worked from the beginning of time. God is always at work. And he made us in his image so that we also would work. Well, look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. That, look at what God did here in the, in the beginning when he made people. Now, in case you don't know what happened before this, it's just 25 verses, there was nothing, then God made everything. You now know the entire Bible up until this point in Scripture, right? There you go. And then, after God made everything except for humans, he says in verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so up until this section, God took nothing. He worked. He spoke. He said, let there be, let there be, let there be. And there was, and there was, and there was. God worked and made everything. And then he works and he makes man in his image, male and female. He created them in his image. And then look what he does, has them do in verse 28. God who is fruitful and making and multiplying uh, continues in verse 28, and God blessed them. That means uh, blessing is when you put your favor. You said, this, this is my favor. This is what I want someone to do. This is good. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. He took Adam and Eve and he put them to work. In fact, go over to chapter 2. Y'all, it's just a roof leak. We'll be fine. You know, just don't worry about all that. It's, and those are just deacons doing what deacons do, serving while we all learn the Bible. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. So here's, look at what happens in Genesis chapter 2. I had to point it out because we were all looking, you know. So thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, so look at Genesis chapter 2. God makes us to work. And then in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, here's what God specifically says about Adam and Eve. After he makes Adam, God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Not only did he assign him work, but he assigns him work in verses 16 and 17 within the boundaries of keeping his commandments. Or rather, in his work, it would be keeping his commandments, and there are even boundaries within that. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. God made, and then he makes Eve, and they get to work, right? Like, 
God made people in his image, and God who works make people, makes people who are designed to work. But then chapter 3 happens. Something ruins everything. That God who delights in glorifying himself made people who also work and glorify him in that, in, that uh, in a perfect place, in a perfect world. And then in chapter 3, something terrible happens that ruins everything about everything in this world. If you're, on, you're f- unfamiliar with the church story or with the Bible story in Genesis chapter 3, the idea of sin is introduced into the world. That God made work to be very good. At the end of chapter 1, he puts something to work and says, this is, this is very good. In chapter 2, we see he specifically assigns them, you're to work it and to keep it, and you're to do it in accordance with how I have designed this world. And then in chapter 3, the design of the world is broken by sin. And the consequences are interesting. You see, we know because of the gospel that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're in here today and you're not sure whether or not you will earn a right standing with God or whether or not you have a relationship with God, I want to ask you a question. Are you perfect? No. Fantastic. The Bible says that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because everybody has. God's perfect standard is ruined by sin and it wrecks us spiritually. We're not just like worse, we are dead, the Bible describes. We are old and need to be made new. We were walking in light and now we're walking in darkness because of sin. That's everybody who has ever lived except for Jesus from Adam on. And so not only does sin ruin our spiritual lives, but y'all, sin ruins this world. There is evil in the world today Not because that's the way God designed it, but because that's the way that sin has made it. And God is in the process of remaking the world, reconciling, restoring the world back to himself by conquering all that sin has done and recreating everything just like in the beginning when he made everything perfect. And in this broken world where there's evil, you know what else gets affected? Our work. In fact, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Then leading up to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, uh, Satan comes as a serpent, and he begins to trick Eve and Adam uh, as they're going about their work to disobey God's command in their work to keep the Garden of Eden. He tricks Eve. Adam sins. The New Testament tells us that sin came through Adam, vitally important that we understand that for the gospel later. And in that process, everything falls. God's perfect creation is now marred by sin. And here's specifically what God says begins to be affected in verse 17 with the guy. Now with the, uh, with the serpent, serpent says the woman, the woman says Uh, Adam. Adam says, well, the woman you gave me, you know, Adam blames God. It's a beautiful, terrible spiraling down that we've all experienced with sin. And then in verse 17, here's specifically what God says happened because of sin. Uh, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, not that men should not listen to the voice of their wives, but specifically relating to being led into sin, because you have Sinned and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Listen to what happens. Cursed is the ground because of you. The ground that I gave you to keep and to work no longer will be joyful, but is now cursed. And then he continues on. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In other words, what was going to just grow and be given to you, you now are going to have to work hard for in order to protect it and make it grow and thrive because it has been 
ruined. Verse 19, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. It's not going to be provided for you anymore. You're going to have to get at it hard till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here's what sin did in Adam's life and in Adam's world and in our life and now our world living in Adam's world that's full of sin. Sin took work which was beautiful and given to us by God and ruined it all and made it hard. Like That's why when you go to work and you don't get along with people around you and when work is not enjoyable and when your boss is unfair and when people are ruining your life, and when you get called in and you shouldn't have been called in, and when you go back at the end of the day and feel like I've accomplished nothing, I don't feel complete in this job, all of that has happened not because uh, work itself is bad or evil, but because work has been made evil by sin. You were designed to work and enjoy work, and sin has ruined that and taken that from you. That's what sin does. Sin always kills. You know this in areas where you have touched the fire of sin and been burnt and scarred, where you thought you could get close, but it ruined everything. Sin ruins everything, and sin has ruined work. But here's where it gets good. Because the gospel that reconciles all things back to God reconciles your work. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The apostle Paul writes, he is the image, that's Jesus, of the invisible God. The firstborn, that's a term of rule and authority over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, a, a, a term of position. And in him, all things hold together. Jesus holds everything together. Verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him, everything, that in everything, he might be preeminent. So in case you've missed it so far, Paul is helping us see Jesus is God. He is over everything. He made everything through the gospel. Now he's going to reconcile everything because he has the power to do that. For in him, verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things. So not just your spirit, all things, not just your relationships, all things, not just evil in this world, all things, including your work. Look at the rest of verse 20. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Here's God's design in the gospel. Not only to reconcile you and your life and your soul back to himself forever, but also to reconcile all of creation that was ruined by sin, including your work. And this changes things, y'all. Like, this changes every aspect of our life. This changes our work. That you've been designed to work. And in the gospel, you are now redesigned. And it may not change what you do, but it will, it will change how you do it and what you do it for. And that's what God does through the gospel with your work. You're not just in the military. You're not just in an IT field. You're not just in a blue collar or a white collar or I don't know whatever call, like you're not that's not what you are you are you're doing things for a different reason you are doing things for the very sake of working for God in fact in chapter 3 of Colossians Paul continues on he says do everything as unto the Lord and not as unto an earthly master for you are working for the Lord you are his. Everything about you is his. And he's reconciling all things back to himself. So, now as a follower of Christ, we know that work which was designed by God to be good was ruined by Satan's temptation and the introduction of sin into the world. And we know that through the gospel, sin is conquered, death is is no more. You are made new, and the enemy no longer has authority and power over you. You serve 
God. So how in the world do we glorify God at work and kick Satan's butt? Proverbs chapter 24, verses 23 through 34 is going to give us insight into that. And the first way is this. Pursue godliness, not glory, through work. Pursue godliness, not glory, through work. The enemy would love for you to find your highest value and your highest beauty and your highest calling to be what you do for 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 hours a week and not what you will do for all of eternity. Find your, pursue godliness, not glory, through work. Look at Proverbs chapter 24, beginning in verse 23. Watch as this continues on. These also are sayings of the wise. Okay, do you remember at the very beginning we said that the book of Proverbs opens up with a summary statement, chapter 1, verse 7, uh, that uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and fools despise knowledge and instruction. That we understand that the fear of the Lord is finding all and value, and God is the supreme of all things, both because he is beautiful and wonderful, and also because he can squish us. That's fear of the Lord. We fear him because we don't want him against us, and we fear him because he is far above all things. That happens through the gospel. The gospel is the process of you realizing you are far away from God and you need to be made perfect. And so God, through the gospel, sent Jesus so you would be made perfect. And now you're being made like Jesus, having been given the position of Jesus through the gospel. In other words, we, uh, uh, the fear of the Lord, the wise life, is being like Jesus. So this continued process of being like Jesus Jesus in pursuing godliness, not glory, through work. Look at verse 23, the second half. Partiality in judging is not good. Verse 24. Whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Now, wicked in the book of Proverbs is the opposite of godly. In other words, God's people have a standard in their lives, especially when it comes to every area and in this area of work that supersedes all other standards, all other requirements, all other responsibilities, all other expectations that may be placed on us by others. It is the standard of godliness. And we now, as people who represent the name of Christ, we would not dare call something that is ungodly godly, regardless of their position at work, their position in our family, their position in government, their position of authority, whether they're above or below us in the flow chart of however it works. We understand that godliness is the standard because God has said it. And we would not dare say to those who are actually wicked, oh, no, 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 you are right. Now, there's a word that kind of uh, summarizes this, the set, first half of verse 23. He's describing what partiality is. In other words, partiality is because of who you are and your position and your relationship to me, and the value that I find in your relationship to me and who you are, I'm going to overlook what is actually wicked and evil and say it is right. Y'all, I don't have to go far to say that political season is upon us, isn't it? How easy is it for us to validate the actions of those with whom we favor politically, even though morally they are corrupt? I know what I said. We know that, that we can do that. How easy is it at work for us to go along with things and people that we know are not right just because we fear their position and authority politically? 
Y'all, you know my story. You know how hard it is. I feel, have felt, and still feel the pull of being drawn even into this, this job. I mean, you Gary can attest afterwards, and Daryl can attest afterwards, and every pastor in this church, that even in ministry, there is ungodly pulling toward what you will and will not do, or what you will and will not count, or what you will and will not find value in, in your church. I'm telling you, y'all, partiality goes nowhere with the Lord, because God's people have a standard of godliness that supersedes all things. And we now, as being, as made new people, we don't pursue glory through our profession. We, we pursue godliness through the confession that we have that God is the king of all things and all things are submitted to him. So what do we do with this practically? Man, years ago, a guy taught me a phrase and it's not uncommon. I'm sure he got it from somebody somewhere and I should probably cite it properly, but I didn't chase it down. It's simply this. When you're at work, when you're at work and you are encountering wickedness and you are tempted to show partiality, to overlook or underlook in order to go, away, to go along with, I don't mean that someone is doing something that you don't understand. I don't mean you don't like the person that's assigned over you. I don't mean that you disagree with the gray area morally decision of what should and shouldn't happen at your job. I mean, a gentle, like a gentleman approached me uh, about two years ago and said, I just, I need you to pray for me. I'm at work and I'm being asked to uh, sweep under the rug this $1.2 million decision and I, I can make it go away, but I know as a Christian I shouldn't. Would you pray for me? Y'all, that's hard. That's hard. That's real hard. When you are approached with that, whether it's uh, uh, something like that or something even small or whatever it is, where you just know, like, this is not the standard of godliness that I'm to live to, or I cannot put my stamp of approval on that wickedness. Like, when you do that, here's what you do in your mind. You counter unbiblical thinking with biblical truth. You get somewhere in verse 26 where you can find an honest answer. Uh, the, the word, this is weird, right? Now, some of you teenagers are going to be like super honest now with the person that you're pursuing. Like, now I get a kiss or whatever. Like, that's not, that's not how this works. That's not what actually is going on here. No, that was funny. That was funny. That wasn't funny? Whatever. All right, so like in that process, I thought it was funny. It's a dad joke. So like in that process, I've had them for years before I was even a dad. So now I can use them all, right? In that, in that process, the, the idea is simply uh, uh, make, maybe more literally, it would be like um, whoever gives a, ver a, good, a good verdict or a good conclusion silences lips. You know, I guess if a kiss is good, you don't talk. I don't know. Like, but like in that process, like that, that's, that's, the, that's the euphemism here, uh, literally translated. If you give a, a good, honest answer, no one has anything to say. And so what you need in your soul is to find someone who's going to speak to you honestly. Honesty in Scripture is, are those things that align with God's standard. Though You need to find someone who can help you think biblically about your unbiblical situation. That you would pursue godliness over glory on earth. So not only do we pursue godliness, not glory through work, y'all, I'm telling you, if you want to kick the enemy's butt at work, you make the godly standard of godly living in Christ's name exalted in all that you do and in all the standards that you have I'm not saying that that's easy. I'm not saying you get promoted. I'm not saying you keep your job. But what I am saying is that there's something much greater to live for than simply a job that will replace you in a week. Pursue godliness, not glory, through work. Second, produce, practice, and prepare rather than consume, wing it, and improvise. Pursue, practice, and prepare rather than consume, wing it, and improvise. 
Look at verse 27. Solomon writes, prepare your work outside. Okay, now we need to know. He is literally, uh, he's figuratively talking about outside as opposed to the rest of verse 27. Get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. This is an instruction on how to be a contractor and help someone build a house. This is the principle of preparedness. This is the principle of practice. This is the principle of taking the time to make sure what you're producing ought to be produced rather than sitting and taking and winging it and improvising. Uh, another word for another, this, this could be translated because Hebrew is super fun uh, and just confusing sometimes. This, the, 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 the idea of house uh, could also be referred to like household or family. That like you ought to before you, man, okay, you ought to before you pursue a relationship with someone who you think ought to be your spouse, number one, make sure that they think you ought to be a spouse as well. But then on top of, because otherwise, otherwise it's just called stalking, right? Like, uh, you know, like, as you think about that stage of life, young people, you need to know you probably ought to get your act together. Uh, young ladies all the time, and this isn't picking on young guys, but it is picking on young guys. There's like a, there's, there is a, a, a beautiful multitude in each church I've served in of young women who love Jesus and just want a man. I don't mean like, I don't mean like a boy who spends all his money on toys and like jokes around about dumb stuff. I mean like someone who actually loves Jesus and is leading others and following him and going after him. And they're like waiting for that, man. They're like, they're like waiting for that. It's almost like the idea of preparing for what God would have you do is lost among that group. Okay, I'm picking on you and that is now over. Here's the deal. We know the principle of preparedness. We know that what God is calling you to will take work. And it's often on the backs of those who would bear up the call of Christ and his cross and sacrificing for the sake of others. It's often by the brow and the sweat of those who would do the hard work of turning the wrenches and getting it done that gets the gospel to the mission field. Every great missionary movement was by someone who, would set, who said, I will go. And they suffered significantly losing all for the sake of the gospel. You have to know that if you want to kick Satan's butt with your work, you want the enemy to have one less way to lead you astray, you practice the principle of producing and practicing and being prepared rather than sitting and saying, will somebody tell me what to do? I'm just going to figure it out as I go. I'll worry about it when I get there. When God has given you the mental faculty to think about it now and prepare now. Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, if God is calling you, if God is calling you, if God is calling you to the next stage and season of life, begin now. Don't wait till you get there. At work, if God is calling you to the next thing to do, y'all get at it. Work ahead in your qualifications. Be, be someone who others look at and go, I don't like Jesus, but I like Jesus in you. Be someone who looks at and says, that, I don't agree with what you believe, but I can't argue with how you're acting here. Man, those who are outside of work, if you're retired, I, I want you to know you... Man, you have such an opportunity to lead the generations behind you in a life that glorifies God by showing that you're living out the principle of preparing for what is next, of placing the highest value in your last decades on sacrificing for the sake of the kingdom, on leading out of bringing the gospel to our community and the nations. And I know I'm 34, and I know that I don't quite have the years behind that, but the Bible is full of example after example after example of those who gave their life in the last decades of their lives for the sake of the gospel being made 
known. This principle is for all of us. How to glorify God and kick Satan's butt at work. Oh, another thing you can do is don't be a consumer. Don't wing it and improvise. But you get at it, producing, practicing, and preparing so that as you get everything ready, you then go build that house. So not only at work do we pursue godliness and not glory, not only do we produce and practice and prepare rather than consume or wing it and improvise, but verses 28 and 29, here's what we're going to see. We want to be those as followers of Christ that make others better by our presence. There are those who light up a room when they come in because you know they're here to help and you know I can trust them. And there are those who light up a room when they leave because you know, thank God, they're out of the way and I couldn't trust them. Let's really get to work. Look at chapter 24, verses 28 and 29. Solomon writes, be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. This is more than testifying in the court of law. This is someone who their word and their work is trustworthy. Do not say, verse 29, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. Years ago, I had a guy, and I haven't always been good at this, uh, but someone I worked with just continued to berate and belittle. And I don't know if this was the right way or the wrong way, but it was the way I did it. I just started complimenting him every single time he threw something back at my face. And I tell you what, man, it was hard. It was hard. I didn't want to hit him with compliments, right? I mean, in my younger years, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to, it doesn't matter what I wanted to do. The point was, it was a constant process of, of figuring out that, uh, of how to just, like, I'm going to just bless this guy, or I'm just going to do that, because he is not doing that to me my way. And here's what happened. It doesn't always work like this. It doesn't always work like this. Uh, Proverbs are principles that are true most of the time in most situations, right? That's, that's what Proverbs are. They are true sayings based on a biblical way of living. So after a while, he finally cracked. And he said, why do you do that? And I had a chance to share the gospel. Now, it would be cool if he came to faith in Christ and didn't believe, but at least he understood. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a moment where I could have so many times gotten this guy back, and I have taken that route before. But there is beauty in the Christian life when you can come to the place where you realize my job is to uphold the value of God in this person's life, not to be their judge and jury, not to lower the standard of godliness and say what is right, what is wrong is actually right, but rather to be someone who would say, vengeance could be mine, but it isn't. It's the Lord's. That we would be those that when they come around, they know, regardless of how they have been toward us, we will do unto them as we would have wanted done unto us. That's what Jesus told his people. And we as Jesus' people, we want to make others better by our presence. Last but not least, verses 30 and 34. Look at verse 30 and 34. Solomon concludes with, this beautiful description of seeing a sluggard and learning his lesson, or rather, learning lessons from the sluggard. That, at our work, we not only would glorify God by pursuing godliness and not our own glory through work, that we would produce and practice and prepare rather than just consume and improvise, that we would be those who bear the name of Christ, who when others gather with us, they know what it is to gather with Jesus. But we would also, verses 30 and 34, to kick Satan's butt at work, 
Just work hard. I mean, honestly, just pull yourself. How many people at your job do you say, man, they work so hard? And the guys who do, the girls who do, the people who do, they stand out. Now, that doesn't make them godly, but it does mean that they're doing something that God would ask his people to do. Look at verses 30 through 34, Solomon writes this. He says, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. Okay, do you see the parallel? The sluggard is someone who lacks sense. That's not what we want to be in Proverbs or in the whole Bible. There's never a passage that says the sluggard is awesome. That doesn't exist anywhere. Someone who lacks sense is what you want to be. That doesn't exist anywhere. He passed by his field, verse 31, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I thought about it. I looked, and I received instruction. He, he's going to tell us the lesson that he learned. He says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want, that is need, like an armed man. You see, we, we know as a follower of Christ, looking at a job, that if we were to remove ourselves, we would want to be those who set the example and pace at work, not because we're working for them, but because we're working for God. And little by little, over time, if we aren't very careful, if we're not maintaining the standard of serving God, not those around us, if we let that line slip, we will find ourselves working more and more like those around us who work for everybody else, rather than working for God himself, and you will watch as things begin to slip. So what do we do with all of this? Well, we claim that the gospel can redeem our work. You are not too far off or too far gone or too far down the line in your job to start working as if you worked for Christ today because you do. So in this moment, here's how we apply this text. Here we go. Number one, where is Satan kicking your butt at work when it comes to representing Christ? I don't mean only in presenting him the gospel to those around you. You, of course, ought to be doing that. But I mean in others, seeing the example of someone who's been named and made different and made like Jesus, how they would work in that field if they were working for God himself. How is Satan kicking your butt at work? Now, here's, here's the temptation. The temptation is, look, is to white knuckles. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to work. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to get at it. I'm going to I'm going to Right? That's what, that's what we have a temptation to do. Well, okay, no, let, let's look at the heart issue under that. Because God's motivation for you is not to work so you can be made better. God's motivation for you is to work so you can glorify Him more fully. So the question is not, how can I work harder, but what, how can I change my motivation to change how I work, which will be working harder, perhaps. So the second question, after we figure out where is Satan kicking my butt at work, is simply this. How does the gospel reconcile that? When you think about that area of your life, now what would it look like with the lens of the gospel restoring it? You might not change what you do, but man, you will change how you do it and whom you do it for. You're still going to write code or whatever. I don't even know what that means, but you're still going to do that. Like you're still going to mop, you know, or swab or whatever. Like you're, you're still going to do that. But now how does my motivation change so that this is no longer a way I can just appease those over me, but a way that I can glorify my God who has saved me? How does the gospel reconcile that? So that being said, let's pray. Let's think through that, and let's sing a song. 
In fact, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you're going to hear some music begin to play. And as music begins to play, why don't you just ask yourself these two questions? Like, where in your work is Satan kicking your butt? You might say, I'm a stay-at-home parent, right? My spouse is the one that does all the work. Y'all, don't you believe the lie of Satan that somehow staying home is not work? When Megan goes out of town, it is brutal. <laughs> it is. I need a break to go back to work. You might be thinking, like, I don't really have a very uh, 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 high-profile job or whatever. Like, I don't have rank or I'm not high in my company or I'm just at, uh, 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 just making minimum wage doing whatever. You're, 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 missing, you're missing the point. The point is simply, how can you do what you do to glorify God the greatest extent possible in the job that he has for you right now? But where is he eating your lunch when it comes to staying at home? What would it look like to allow that one area that he, man, that over and over and over, you, you're failing to call out what is, you're calling what is wicked good, or where you're just being lazy, not that you don't need a rest. Y'all, we could do a whole sermon series on the beauty of the Sabbath. We probably should sometime. But my point is simply this. Where, where is he eating your lunch? And then you say, God, would you help me see what it would look like to reconcile that you would be honored and glorified? You might not do anything different. Maybe your heart needs to change toward that. Maybe your eyes need to change in how you see that. But allow the Lord to wrestle with that in your life. If you're in here as everyone else, just ignore me if you're a follower of Christ and you're talking to the Lord. If you're in here and you're not a follower of Christ, I want you to know that this is not how to get close to God. That's not what we're talking about. We know that faith to the one who does not work, you can't earn your way to God, but believes in God who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accredited as righteousness. That if you're a follower of Christ, you serve him and work faithfully. If you're not a follower of Christ, trying to serve God faithfully will get you nowhere. So, if you're not a follower of Christ and you're in here this morning, this whole conversation begins by simply asking the question, have you come to a place where you will submit your life to Christ, allow your heart to believe the gospel, that you are not perfect, that God is holy, that creates a problem and that Jesus will save you. That if you're here and you want, you, you want to believe that, I want you to know that's not from you. That's from God who is doing that in you. That right now, suddenly you're like, gosh, I need to be saved. Like that's, that's from the Lord. If that's you, why don't you ask God to save you from your sin right now? It sounds something like this. You tell him if that's you, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sin. I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and help me to live and work for you from here on out. If that's you and you prayed something like that, I'd love to talk with you afterwards. During this last song, I'm going to, in a second, invite everyone to stand. It doesn't mean you have to. You respond however is appropriately to you. You're welcome to come up front and pray over your job. You're welcome to come uh, uh, up front and pray over people around you. You're welcome to sit in your seat. You can run the aisles. Just try not to trip over other people and distract them. I mean, just you respond as the Lord calls you to, or you can just stand there and sing. And it, it's however the Lord is leading you. But let's respond appropriately to Jesus right now. And let's walk out of here more in love with Jesus and more like him than when we came. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being our King. We ask God that you would help us to have the courage and conviction to respond to you. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray.